something that was staring you right in the face? Now, you ladies may laugh because you have had to direct your husband into certain things because there was something that was staring them directly in the face. Well, I am the stereotypical man. I have a tendency to be somewhat less than observant. I'm not always on top of things. Um, I've said before, without my cell phone calendar, I would not get anywhere on time. I wouldn't even know I missed it. My wife is, is the one who is far more organized than I am. Which is funny, because one of the things I love to play, one of the games, one of the computer games or in books or anything like that, I love the hidden object games. You guys ever played any of those? I love those. Mm -hmm. And they are some of the neatest games, especially like if you do the computer ones or, or anything like those. The problem is, again, I'm, I'm kind of bad at it. And eventually, I usually have to use the hints that are on there. And then I feel really stupid when I see where they're at because I was looking right there. I know I was looking at it. Usually, I think that they added it after I hit the hint and they were just tricking me. But I think it's the same way with God and God's people, isn't it? God is at work doing a new thing and we don't see it. God is at work making things happen that have never happened before and we don't get it. Our creator who makes all things new, our Redeemer in whom we are new creations, our Redeemer in whom we are new, our indwelling Holy Spirit who brings new life. The prophet Isaiah is sharing God's message in this scripture. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And this was the dilemma of the people of, of Judah. They were caught in an exile in Babylon. And they were wondering if they were ever going to get home again. And, and Isaiah, you know, I, I kind of think of Isaiah as a parent talking to a child. And as much as we make fun of, of men having trouble seeing something right in front of their face, how much worse are kids at it? Have you ever had to tell your child, okay, it's right there, where? Your foot is on it. <laughs> Pick up the sock. And I really feel like Isaiah was, was doing this to the people. I really think, people, people, listen. God is saying he's doing a new thing. He's already at work. You're wanting to go home. He's already working on it. Don't you see it? Don't you get it? Wake up. Open your eyes. God is making a way home. So, it is with God's people in the 8th century before Christ in Babylon. And so it is with God's people now. In the 21st century after Christ in this world. God's at work. Don't you see it? God is making a way for us. He's saying, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers. In the desert. And we miss it. So why don't we see God's new thing? Maybe we don't see what God is doing because we are afraid about change. Now understand, I said afraid about change. I didn't say we're afraid of change. We are, but more broadly... We are afraid about change. I mean that we are afraid not to change, but we're equally afraid 
that change is coming. We are afraid that if we do not change, we'll miss out. But we're also afraid if we change too much, we'll fall off the right path. We're afraid about change. My first Sunday here at Ratner was January 6th. On that day, I have to admit, I felt a little bit of fear. I was afraid, afraid about change. On the one hand, I was afraid to do something different from what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Afraid that the phone was going to ring and someone was going to need counseling. Afraid that I would not know what to do when someone asked for help. Basically, I was afraid to change. And yet, I was also afraid of not following God's direction and accepting the post here at Radnor. I was afraid that if I stayed on at my previous church, decline would set in. I was afraid that the new challenges that were going to be springing up there were ones for which I was not well equipped. And so I was afraid of not moving, as well as afraid of going ahead to move. I was afraid about change. But fear, fear prevents us from trusting God's leadership. Fear keeps us paralyzed and unwilling to make decisions. And so God says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Understand the verb tense in what I just read? God says, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. I have. It's done. It's over. It's finished. Now remember that when those words were, were spoken, Judah was still in exile. Her people were still locked up in Babylon. No one had yet gone back to Jerusalem. There was no rebuilding plans. There was no blueprint for the future. There wasn't even a clear understanding about who would lead the nation. Even once they returned. Nothing had been done, but yet everything had been done. No human plans had been made, but God's will had, was already set in motion. I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. God was saying, it's done, even if you don't see it. Just share something similar to what FDR said. The only thing we Christians have to fear is fear itself. The only thing that we have holding us back from a, a godly, triumphant living is that nagging fear about change. It will not serve us well to moan and groan about the good old days when more people worship here now than, than they used to. And that's a deadly fear. I heard somebody say one time, things just aren't the way they used to be. And somebody replied, it's getting more and more that way all the time. <laughs> yeah, it is. They're not wrong. Things change. <clears throat> to complain about things that we don't like the way things used to be is to fail to see what God is doing among us. If we let fear take us over, we will deny the hope that is in us. Did you know, and I found this fascinating, it was once believed that cars would not be the way of the future because the thought was if you drove your car more than 30 miles per hour, it would take all the breath out of you and you would suffocate. <laughs> Did you know that? That was actually a fear at one time. It was once believed 
that using radio and TV signals were of the devil because the Bible makes a reference to Satan in the book of Ephesians as Satan being the ruler of the air. And since the signals went through the air, somehow they were under Satan's control. Did you know that? Now, granted, if you watch some of those stupid reality TV out there, you might wonder if Satan's kind of involved in some of those. But let's be honest. Think about how many people have been reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ because of television or radio signals. Things used to be different. Yeah, that's true. You know that churches didn't used to have chairs or pews? Anybody want to go through, and back then services were like three hours long. Anybody want to stand for three hours and hear me talk? I don't even want to hear me talk for three hours. <laughs> Did they have musical instruments? Nope. Things changed. And I'm not saying that all the change has been for the good, but change does happen. You see, God is always doing a new thing, and the only thing that will keep us from seeing it is fear. God says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine, and I love you. See, church, it's done. God has named you. That settles the issue. You're going to succeed. You're his. Now, we have to remember, succeeding in our eyes and succeeding in God's eyes are two different things. You may say, well, I, I tried to do something new and nobody showed up. Okay. Did you do what God told you to do? Well, yep, you succeeded. Our job is not to control everybody else. Our job is to control ourselves. Make sure that we follow God's directions ourselves. Now, I've been talking about God's new thing that we don't see. And I've mentioned that, that God is doing something special, but we don't perceive it. So what might that be? What is it that God is doing among us? Sometimes, sometimes when people find themselves in uncertain times, they resort to unproductive religion. Did you know that Judah, after the exile, tried to rebuild its life by becoming exclusive and legalistic? They tried to put a distance between themselves and other people. Judah felt that the only way to preserve itself was to get inside a time capsule, in essence, and preserve it by keeping away from others kind of makes us think about the church in the world now, doesn't it? How do we live in unsettled times? Well, if you look at Judah's history, you learn that one thing you can do is become exclusive, restricted, and closed down. It didn't work out real well for them, though, so I highly suggest not doing that. I've had the opportunity to travel to different areas of the world and work in different missions fields. And these fields included areas in different cultures. I have uh, been to Yakima, Washington, which is home to the Yakima Indian tribe. They do things a little differently there. If I were to look at the missions work I did in Jamaica, with the eyes of the American church, it would look wrong. If I looked at the church service I attended in Haiti with the eyes of an American church, it would look wrong. It was a six-hour service in Creole. I didn't understand a word they were saying. But, but, understand, if I, however, looked at their culture with the eyes of their culture, it looks just fine. And more importantly, if I look at it through the eyes of God, it looks just fine. 
You see, we can't be rigid in our perceptions. And I'm willing to view things from a different perspective. I believe that the future of this church lies in the willingness to reach all people. And you all are already doing a great job of that. But can't we always do more? By reaching out to everyone means that they can't look, sound, maybe even smell like we do. I mean that God's new thing for us is understanding and affirming of all people as sons and daughters of God. And so today, I have one word to offer, one concept to proclaim, and that is witness. Witness. Bear testimony. If you see what new thing God is doing, then bring a witness about it. If you understand that God is doing a new thing, and you perceive it, then tell somebody. And so we again look to the words of Isaiah. Let all nations gather together, and let people assemble. Let them bring their witnesses, and let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, a servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe and understand. Now, that may mean things. But we also can't be afraid. Being afraid about change will paralyze you. Don't be afraid, for God has already won the victory and calls us to join him in what he is doing. <coughs> because we have to remember, Jesus changed things a lot. The people of Jesus' time, they had no idea what was in them. God have been directing the Israelite people for hundreds and thousands of years. And then Jesus comes in and all of a sudden, we shift directions. He was ready to make a change. He was making a new thing. And we also must look out. Look to the east and the west, the north and the south. Embrace one another's differences. Celebrate one another's gifts. Be patient with one another and marvel at what God does. And just watch and pray. And pray and watch. And then speak. Witness. Share what your heart has in it. If God has done nothing, then you don't have anything to say. But if God is doing a new thing, testify, witness, and invite. One of the things that Jesus did differently, and it really, really threw his disciples off, remember, was they sat down for a meal called Passover. And it was a ceremony that the Israelite people had been doing for 400 some years. And so everybody knew their parts. Everybody knew what was going to be said. Have you ever done that before? You're going through a ceremony or something and you're kind of half listening, but you're also making a grocery list in your head or things that you're going to do after you get out. And then all of a sudden, Jesus just threw them off. He said, we're going to be doing things a little differently tonight. And of course, all the disciples were like, John, you talk to him. He, he listens to you. Tell him how to change things. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Christian, can you go to the slide, please? See, not all change is good. <laughs> they didn't have computers back then. But that's okay. I have it on my screen, but I don't think y'all can see it from there. So. You didn't save it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's all right. How about I just recite it for you all and you just nod your heads along with me. <laughs> Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive, forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. 